The federal government remained shut down for a 14th day because of an ongoing argument over funding for security along the southern border. A new story published in The New Republic follows one immigrant's painful journey from Mexico to the United States and back again. The piece is titled Jailed, Raped, Deported, Robbed. It describes Aldemio Orozco Ramirez's life in the U.S. beginning when he first crossed the border in 1993. So for more on this story is New Republic contributor Elliot Woods. He joins us now via Skype. Elliot is also a correspondent for Outside Magazine, and you are in Plano, Texas. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Elliot. I think the title says a lot about the challenges that Ramirez yeah. has faced over the years. Um, but let's talk a little bit about his life in the U.S. before he was deported. D the last time, I should clarify. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was living with his whole family on a ranch in a rural part of eastern Montana, pretty close to the North Dakota border. And he was entrusted by the owners of the ranch to basically manage ranch operations in terms of all the labor that's required to to keep one of these ranches going. And he had all eight of his children there and his wife and his kids were all in school. And that was probably the most stable and, uh, and I would say the best part of his life in terms of his own reflection on his life. Now he was, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but he was deported a number of times. And it actually at one point, he was banned from setting foot in the U.S., uh, which is kind of the ultimate penalty for this kind of behavior. But what changed for him in terms of his immigration status when President Trump took office? The important thing that changed when President Trump took office is that he issued an executive order that essentially revised the Obama administration's policies that were more lenient toward what are called non-criminal aliens. In other words, people who haven't committed felony crimes, violent crimes, drug offenses, and things like that. A lot of those people were able to stay here under this kind of limbo system where <clears throat> ICE would not go after them even if they knew where they were because they were prioritizing criminal aliens who are much easier to put through the immigration enforcement system and deport. So it's less costly and more efficient to target criminal aliens than it is to include tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of non-criminal aliens in this enforcement system. So that was the late Obama administration's policy was to target criminal aliens only. And as soon as Trump took office, he, he changed that policy and started going after essentially everyone. And Aldemio had these previous removal orders from his prior deportation. And so he suddenly became available for ICE, essentially. And so he was picked up and, and deported at one of his monthly check-ins with ICE. You know, I, I have I, I have a feeling that some of your readers and some of our viewers are, are going to be torn over this because, as we said, he had been deported numerous times. He was actually banned from setting foot in the U.S. for, I think, 20 years is what you wrote. So there are going to be those who don't have a lot of sympathy for that aspect of this story. But what he alleges that happened, I think, it would horrify anyone when he was in custody. He says that he was raped. Tell me about that. Tell me about when he tried to report that and what, what happened after that. Well, <clears throat> he, he was transferred to another facility in Idaho, in Rigby, Idaho, a couple of days after the rape occurred. And there he was able to actually use the phone and he was able to get in touch with his family and his daughter, I think, or, or son, I can't remember right now, translated with the guards for him and, and got him in touch with a Spanish speaking ICE officer uh, and he was able to get to a clinic. She sent him to a clinic to have some testing done and the testing by the nurse on hand found that he had various symptoms and including physical symptoms that suggested that his claims to have been raped were, were true, were consistent with the way that someone behave, would behave if they'd been sexually assaulted and including physical symptoms that <clears throat> seem to be consistent with his claims. Um, so from that point forward, one would hope that the justice system would take these accusations seriously and investigate them and, and give them all the seriousness that they deserve. And it just doesn't appear that that ever happened. And that's where the system seems to have failed. And that would be a failure whether the person was a U.S. citizen or not, because yeah, the law is the same. So I want
want to sort of piggyback off of something that Don said, and you write in the piece, you know, it could be said that Audemio set his own trouble into motion in 1993 when he paid a coyote $300 to help him cross the border. Um, I wanted to ask you, because there are many, many, many stories out there about why uh, people cross the border illegal to get, illegally to get into this country. As uh, Don pointed out, you know, he crossed the border several times. It seems like, according to your story, initially he was just with his wife and one child. He now has eight children. Why did you want to tell his story? The reason that <clears throat> I chose to tell Aldemio's story is because it's a family story. And it's about a family that very quickly became an American family and really you know, seven of the children are U.S. citizens. They were in school in the United States, that, and especially living out there in eastern Mon Montana, these kids were playing eight-man football in a rural high school football team. They were dressing in cowboy dress and just fully integrated into this community. And because of their parents' decision to, to come into the United States to skirt the official immigration system, they were never allowed to live that life with the security that the rest of us enjoy who are citizens. And I, I started that section by saying perhaps Ademio set his own trouble in motion by paying a coyote to make it clear that there is some responsibility on the part of the people who come to the country by skirting the official immigration system, by coming here undocumented. But throughout the story, I try to make it clear that the responsibility is much larger than that. There's a demand in the United States for labor, for immigrant labor, whether we're talking about the need for coders in Silicon Valley, or we're talking about the need for agricultural workers or service sector workers. There's a need for immigrant labor in this country. And for whatever reason, we maintain a class of immigrants who are perpetually insecure yeah. while, we, while we create immigration mechanisms for other classes of immigrants. And to me, that's highly problematic. And I think the story about Demio and his family shows the cruelty and the brutality of that system. So while each individual immigrant who crosses without documentation makes that choice and understands the risks, at the same time, as even President George W. Bush or the late John McCain acknowledged very clearly, the immigration system is broken and there needs to be a way for, for immigrants who are coming to, to work in these jobs to come here and live safely and securely. And as if his tribulations weren't enough, you end your piece talking about how he was robbed at knife point at the end. This is a timely story. Ellie Woods, thank you so much. Thank you.